Good evening. Some of you heard me say in class this morning that I'll be traveling this week and I'm going to Texas. It's finally cooled down a little bit out there and it's rained and so it should be a little bit more comfortable than, than it has been for the last uh, two, three months out there. But I'm going uh, to uh, Dallas in particular and on Wednesday night I'll be speaking at the Louisville Church of Christ where the following Sunday they're going to have their annual Mission Sunday. And uh, this Mission Sunday is to make a special contribution uh, for mission work in which they're going to give it all away. And this is a church that has a $31,000 average contribution on, uh, on, on every Sunday. And so it could be that, uh, you know, quite a bit of money will be raised. But they have allowed me to come out and make a presentation on heritage, as they do every year, by the way, either me or some of our people, uh, on the Wednesday night before, so that uh, as they decide how they're going to divvy it up, then uh, they will um, uh, keep us in mind and the fact that we train preachers and missionaries and Bible teachers. And so I would ask you to pray with me and for me because uh, for safe travel, but also for good success in that particular effort and, um, and uh, other things that I'll be doing, other people I'll be seeing and attempts to uh, raise money, which is a constant thing that uh, there's never any end to. And that's something I do year round, year after year after year after year, and there will never, ever be any relief from it. Unless somebody, uh, you know, leaves us like a huge fortune in which we uh, just won't ever need any more uh, support after that. Well, we're talking about family, and this is really a continuation of a conversation we started probably about a month ago. And uh, in this conversation, we, we were talking about family and how precious and important family is. And um, I like this little um, I like this little article written by my friend Charles Hodge, who uh, I might run across when I'm out there around Dallas. Uh, sometimes I do. He says the family has always been the basic unit in society. Satan always attacks the home, the family. Our drug problem goes far deeper than drugs. It is a failure in the family. Until the family issue is corrected, the drug problem will still exist. Violence in the school, anarchy on the streets, only express failures down at the home front. The family is the first school. Parents cannot turn education responsibility over to public schools. Besides, it's too late. Kids don't go to public school until they're six years old. The preschool training has already formulated them. From birth, a child is taught by the family, good or bad. The family is the first hospital. Hurt children want mommy to kiss their hurt toe. Refuge, healing, helping belongs in the home. Relationships can only be learned in the home. This is where we learn the we be brethren, that we're brothers and we're sisters, that we have a, a name and a family, a heritage and a home. We must stick together. Relationships can only be learned in the home. The family is the first government. The game of life must be played by the rules. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Only in the home can one learn authority, obedience, and cooperation. Only in the home can one learn the real worth of tradition. One cannot obey his parents. One who will not obey his parents certainly will not obey teachers, law enforcement, elders. And so uh, that's my friend Charles Hodge. Uh, that's, a, that's a portion of what he has written there. Have you heard about Lulu? Well, you see, there's this new preacher in town. And one of the preachers who had been there for a while... I was showing him around, and he takes him to the local hospital. And uh, as they're touring the hospital, they go into this particular wing where the mentally disturbed folks are. And they pass by one room, and there's a guy in there sitting in a rocking chair. He's just rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth in this rocking chair. And as he rocks, he's saying, Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. And so the new preacher said, well, now that's sad. What, what's, what? He said, oh, well, it is a sad story. This guy's wife's name was Lulu, and one day she just up and ran off with another man. And ever since then, that's all he does. He just sits and rocks and goes, Lulu, 
Well, they passed by a few more rooms, and then they passed by one, and here's a guy in there sitting on the edge of his bed, rocking back and forth, even at a more rapid pace, going, Lulu, 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 Lulu. And he says, well, now this is strange and very sad. What's this man's story? He said, oh, well, that's the guy that ran off of Lulu. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes families just don't work any way you try them. Um, and so we're talking about family, and I know that uh, some of this is, uh, is review, and so we'll just go through it quickly. We say that the family is valuable and that we need to love and protect and appreciate our family. And then we said that no family is perfect. And if you're looking for a perfect family, then um, just guess what? Until you become a perfect person, you are not going to have a perfect family. And since you can't be a perfect person, uh, then uh, it's, it's unrealistic to expect uh, that other members of your family will be perfect. Now, the ideal family is only on TV. And, um, I, you know, I had a, a picture uh, of Tiger Woods with his wife and their babies. Uh, that, and I had that up there, and I thought, well, that's a little bit too up to date because most of us, you know, we, we, we flash back to the good old days, you know, the 50s and the 60s and black and white TV and these perfect families. The only problem is, is that this is not a family. This is not real. Um, and th- this is not reality. These people are paid actors. And actors usually have really crazy lives and, uh, and, 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 and go through one family after another. And so um, th- the question is asked, um, is it possible to have an ideal family? And um, the answer is, um, well, look, God is perfect. Jesus is perfect. The Holy Spirit is perfect. But as long as families are made up of imperfect people, then um, we're not going to see the ideal family. But you know what? We need, to, uh, we need to aspire to do the very best that we possibly can. I'm in Colossians now. This is Colossians 3. This is just a little uh, condensed version of what we read in Ephesians 5 and 6. And it says this, beginning in verse 17. And whatever you do, this is chapter 3, right? Colossians. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. And so that is, uh, you know, if, if we were sinless people, and if we could follow that without any, um, any hesitation and any difficulty at all, then, of course, uh, we would have better families. Since we're not perfect people, and since all of us make our share of mistakes, and some more than others, then we need to resolve to do the very best that we can. Well, where do we start? Well, we start with desire, 2 Corinthians 8, 11, and 12. And then the belief that our family can be stronger. And then putting forth the proper effort in order to make our family stronger. And the bottom line is this. Anything gets better when we start getting better. It starts with us. If we're waiting on someone else to change and get better, then we're waiting for the wrong person. And what is the formula for success as far as family is concerned? Number one, we got, we've got to care. Number two, we've got to always be willing to learn. Number three, we must put forth effort and try to make our family the best that it can be. And then we must absolutely resolve to stay with our family. And so we must be willing to stay. Revelation 2.10 says that we should uh, uh, be faithful until death. Now, um, I think probably I left off here the last time. This is where... Uh, Paul is talking about uh, how that he was, well, I, 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 in my own notes to myself, 1 Thessalonians two seventeen, he um, says, when I was with you, talking to the folks in Thessalonica, he says, I was gentle with you like a nursing mother is with her child. And so he was saying, that's the way mothers treat their own children. And he's saying, that's the way I was with you. Now, we start out as dependent. That means we are children totally dependent upon our family to take care of us. And then we strive for independence. And then when we get independent, then we start looking for ways to blend our lives with other people. That leads usually to marriage with with most people. By the way, you don't have to get married. And uh, if you choose not to get married, then um, that's your business. But most people 
choose to get married. And there are some special benefits and blessings, of course, to people who decide to get married and to build a family. And so we get to, we become interdependent, meaning that our life um, is blended with someone else's life. And, two, and when people get married, the scripture says it's, uh, it's, uh, that the two people become one flesh. And so um, John was told by the Lord in John chapter 21, 18, he says, um, now you're young right now. And uh, you can do what you want to and you can lift heavy things and you can go where you want to go and do what you want to do. And nobody can say anything about it because you're able-bodied and strong and all that. But he says there will come a day when you can't even dress yourself. That is if you're lucky enough to live long enough to get old and feeble. And he says, and then there will come a day when you can't go where you want to go. Not even with a hover around chair like they're advertising on TV all the time. The Lord didn't talk about hover around. I just threw that in. Uh, but, but he says, you will be dependent on someone else uh, to take you uh, to other places. And so notice the circle of life. We are born uh, and, we come, and we start out in life dependent. And then we want to be independent. And then we are interdependent. And as we are interdependent, we become more and more dependent upon our family. You know what I'm doing? I'm already talking to my son about moving from Decatur, Alabama, back over to Florence, uh, which is an hour, hour and 15 minutes away, uh, just because I'd kind of like for him to settle down close in case I leave before his mother leaves, that he'll be around close just to watch out and take care of her. Why? Because, well, that's part of my responsibility, do anything and everything I can to make sure that, that she is cared for. And one of the ways I can do it is for our son to be closer. And so, now I might not be able to convince him to do this. This is just my plan, you understand. And sometimes my plans and his plans don't, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, work out so well. But I'm laying the groundwork and I'm doing all I can uh, to see if I can't set it up. Well, there are three choices that we make in life. Number one, we make a choice about what we're going to live our life doing. In other words, that's a career choice. Number two, uh, whom we live our life for. In other words, we can live our lives strictly for ourselves. Just be the self-centered, selfish person and just live our lives for ourselves. Or we can devote our lives to other people and uh, to the Lord himself. And then we decide who we're going to live our life with. And so these are some huge choices. What we're going to live our life doing, who we're going to live our life for, and who we're going to live our lives with. Well, those are decisions uh, that uh, all of us come to, uh, to make as life moves on. Now, one of the things we need to do when it comes to family is we need to decide to love our family. Just like God decided to love us. God just made up his mind, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so it's very important for us to make that decision, decision, and once we make that decision, never retreat from it, never back up, stay faithful to the decision we've made, that we're going to stick with our family. Now, there's nothing that will hold a family together like love. Two songs for you, and you know I'm, I love songs and, and songwriters. Um, I was in um, Singapore. Uh, oh, it was... Um, about three years ago, I remember I came back and showed you a slide or two of me preaching and teaching over there. Well, I'm in the Holiday Inn, and the Holiday Inn over there is a big hotel with a big, giant lobby. And some of the church folks are going to meet me there, and uh, we're, they're going to take me out to eat. Well, I'm down there in the lobby, and the lobby is this busy, big, you know, almost like Grand Central Station, Metropolitan City, International City. And uh, there is this... Um, this uh, Young woman and young man there, and they were very talented, and they're entertaining the people in the, uh, in the lobby. And he's on keyboard, and she's singing, and she's playing some kind of instrument. And they sound like Americans, and they're singing American songs. And uh, each one of them that they sing, well, I've, I'm familiar with them, and I just think they are so talented. And so they get to a portion in the program, and the folks still haven't come, and I'm enjoying this. I'm sitting around listening to this. And so... Um, they, they start soliciting uh, requests from the audience. Just folks sitting around in chairs there in the lobby. And, you know, one or two people suggest one, and they try a little of it. And, and I was amazed. I said, how about something by the Eagles? And the Eagles, of course, is, uh, well, that's a Texas group. 
uh, and uh, I like the Eagles and a lot of their songs. And I just, I'm just seeing if they, and they looked at each other and, um, and, uh, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking they're maybe going to do Hotel California or, or, or um, something, a heartache tonight, something like that. But instead, he hits the keyboard and they start singing this song. And it's one that I, I had heard, but I was not that familiar with it, called Love Will Keep Us Alive. I was standing all alone against the world outside. You were searching for a place to hide, lost and lonely. Now you've given me the will to survive. When we're hungry, love will keep us alive. Well, the song goes on, but it's about two people who decide that they are going to put their lives together and they're going to, uh, they're going to let love cement the relationship and love is going to keep them going because love is the most powerful thing. So when we decide to love our family, what we're doing is we are deciding to, um, to, uh, to love our family with all our heart and that it's a heart commitment. Here's one by Johnny Cash. Six foot six, he stood on the ground. He weighed 285 pounds. But I saw that giant of a man brought down to his knees by love. He was the kind of man that would gamble on luck, look you in the eye and never back up. But I saw him crying like a little whip pup because of love. You can't see it with your eyes, hold it in your hands. But like the wind, it covers our land. Strong enough to rule the heart of every man, this thing called love. It can lift you up. Never let you down. Take your world and turn it all around. Ever since time, nothing's ever been found stronger than love. Well, the song goes on, but that's just, um, that's just the poet's way of saying that we need to make a love commitment to our families. And so the scripture says in Colossians 3, 12 through 14, that, uh, that we put aside all of these evil impulses and bad habits and evil desires and behavior and and we and we, instead we turn our hearts inside out and we become kind and gentle considerate people to our family members and then he says and above all these things put on love which is the bond of perfection so i'm just saying uh, that love is what keeps families together now here is a very important part of being a christian uh, in, in a family being a, a member of a family who is a christian and it's this that we have a lot to do with whether or not we help or hinder our spouses in getting to heaven. And I think that's probably uh, vividly pointed out in 1 Peter chapter 3. And so let's, let's go there. Now hold on. I, don't hear me saying and don't hear the Bible saying uh, that if your spouse doesn't get to heaven, it's your fault. I'm not saying that. Scripture's not saying that. I'm just saying that we can do a lot to help our spouse get to heaven. And unfortunately, if we're a certain kind of spouse... And we can be a terrific hindrance to our spouse getting to heaven. And so in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, the scripture says this. Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, that means reverence. Do not let your beauty be that of outward adorning, of arranging of hair, wearing of gold, putting on fine apparel. By the way, he's not saying these things are wrong. He says, don't just let this be all there is to you. He says, but let it be the hidden person, verse 4, of the heart, with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is the very, very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters... You are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them, talking about the wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. He says, your behavior toward your spouse either helps or hinders your spouse's prayers. And so, you know, I, you just, just, just think about it. I mean, uh, I, I'm thinking about it right now. I would never want to be the kind of husband that my behavior toward my wife is such that it keeps her heart so troubled and so broken and so discouraged that it hinders her prayers. That'd be a terrible, evil thing for me to, to do. And that'd be an awful way to me to treat her. And so, um, we need to be the kind of people 
who are dedicated to helping our spouses get to heaven. And I think that we can, we can do that if we determine to with all our hearts. Now, the scripture encourages us to be the kind of parents that uh, make memories for our children. And it's good, it's important to determine to give our children the very best memories possible. So this morning in class, some of you heard a part of my story about my father and uh, how that, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, it's very important for you to understand this, that I love my daddy and I miss him. And, uh, uh, but I didn't have a perfect father. As a matter of fact, I think that, um, that our relationship grew to where I respected and understood him better long after I was a grown man. But... Here's one memory that I don't have. My father is in my lifetime, in my entire childhood, I never saw my father with a Bible in his hand. I never saw my father pray. Uh, I never saw my father read scripture. If he had, guess what? That would be a precious memory to me. That would be something that I would cherish to this day. And for those of you who are fortunate enough to have fathers who love God and love His Word, and they're, they pray unashamedly and openly and with faith, and you see them reading and even studying God's Word, then you are a most fortunate person. And if you've ever heard your mother pray or read the Bible, now I was fortunate in that my, my mother was not like my dad. Uh, and so my mother was, uh, you know, she would pray at the drop of a hat, and she'd drop the hat. Uh, and, and she kept a Bible handy all the time. And, and you know, it was nothing to her just to read, you know, uh, long, long passages of Scripture uh, on a regular basis. And so, um, you know, I, had that, I have that wonderful memory. It was my mom that I remember struggling to get me. I was the oldest. And my little baby brother who was whimpering and crying and bucking and snorting. And her driving a standard shift V8 Ford with the shift up there on the collar, you know. And she wasn't good at that either. And she'd get up and get dressed, you know, on Sunday morning and, uh, and get us all dressed, uh, you know. And it's just a, such a huge hassle. And sometimes she'd set that jaw in her face and I'd see that determination in her eyes and in her face. Now, of course, she was just a very young woman. I thought she was an old woman because I was a little boy. Uh, and, and then she'd get us in that car, you know, and you know, she'd warn us about what we better do and not do. And then she'd fire that thing up and grind those gears and get out there on that road and, and take us to Sunday school. And take us in there and sit us down. And then I'll, she'd say, I'll be back to get you when it's over. Well, you see, I didn't particularly appreciate or enjoy my mother's drill sergeant ways, you see, when I was a little boy. But I look back on that memory, and that is a keeper. That's one right there that I wouldn't take $10 million or $10 trillion for. I wouldn't, well, there's no amount of money on earth. Uh, that, and so what we need to do is we need to look for ways to um, create some good memories for our children so that when they are older, maybe even after we're dead and gone, they will, uh, they, they, they will draw strength from the memories that we left. So this is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. You've heard this passage many times. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, this is verse 4, our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house. And on your gates. Well, it's a, he goes on to say that, we are, they, that the, the Israeli parents were to be the kind of people that ingrained the word of God in their children. And they left the kind of example so that the children would look back and draw strength on them. You've heard the old story about the two little boys who were visiting the zoo. And um, they, they're going from cage to cage looking at these wild animals, ferocious animals. You know, and they're just mesmerized. And they stop in front of one cage, and, and there's some cats in there. Big, and, and there's a sign there that says, wild cats. And one little boy looks at the sign, he looks at these ferocious cats, and then he looks back at the sign, looks at his buddy, and he says, um, sign says, 
wow kids. What makes them wow kids? And little buddy looked at him and said, don't you know? Their mama and daddy were wow cats. Yeah, you see, that's what makes wild cats. And so, you know, you, you, give, me, you give me a, a daddy who's a wild cat and a mama who's a wild cat, and I'll show you some folks who are going to raise some wild cat kids. Amen? And so, and, and, and leave some memories uh, in the, the children's lives and hearts uh, that might possibly do damage for decades and even generations to come. So I'm a, a young preacher. Uh, I'm, um, I'm uh, 12. I'm just out of, uh, of college. And I've started my first full-time work in the beautiful Mayberry town of Rogersville, Alabama. It's um, on a uh, late spring day. It's mid-morning. Um, and must have been on a Saturday because I think school was probably still in session and so I'm out doing a little visiting, and I pull up in front of this little country home because these folks had, they were kind of sporadic, on and off. You know, they would bring their kids to Sunday school sometimes, and, and then they might go for several weeks and not show up. And then and they'd get back for a time or two. And then, Well, anyway, <clears throat> I, uh, I uh, decided that maybe a, a friendly visit from the preacher might be a good thing. And so I drive into the driveway, and I get out. And as I start toward their front door, there is the most vicious fight going on inside. I mean, people screaming and saying awful things. And ooh, it was a, and it was mom and dad and the children. And uh, I'm pretty sure I heard some, I know I heard doors slamming. I think I heard a few plates or vases flying through the air and hitting the, the wall. And I'm telling you, the, just, just, a, just a huge commotion. And I'm thinking... Should I uh, just get back in my car and get on back, you know, to the church building or what should I do? And man, the noise was just, and, and the vibes coming out of that house was awful. And so I don't know what to do and I'm inexperienced and young. And so I just go ahead and knock on the door. And as I knock on the door at first, you know, the, the noise level just increased uh, or kept, uh, kept it going. And so I knocked a little harder and, and the noise inside the house began to um, kind of quieten down. And then I could hear like, shh, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And I could hear whispering and I could hear footsteps and I could hear people going to their rooms and closing doors. And, and then the mother of the house comes to the door and she opens it a little bit and she looks at me. Brother Jones, she said, how are you? And I want to say, are you okay? Is, your, is anybody injured in there? Is there are you, you know, do we need to call a paramedic? What, what's up, you know? But instead, I, I just, I, I say, well, I, I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, well, it's so good to see you. Well, thanks. It's good to see you, too. Um, you know, and so we just kind of, but I never get past that door. I never get in the door. I mean, because she's got her foot right there. She just opened it a little bit, you see, because she doesn't want to see me to see what's, what's been going on in there and all that. Well, I, I, of course, that's just uh, an illustration of what's gone on in many a home and many a family uh, down through the years. And some people are raised with a constant diet of that kind of stuff. As a result of that, their programming is warped as to what a family is and how a family behaves. Now, now, we all get sideways sometimes. There's, there's no use in denying that. But some people live in constant war and turmoil. And home is not a place where you go to retreat. It's not a place sometimes of peace and safety and love and comfort. It's a war zone. We just need to make sure that our homes are not war zones. There might be a battle every once in a while. I'll give you that. But when the battle is settled, we kiss and make up and we recommit our love to each other. We reassure each other that no matter what, we are family and we're sticking together through thick and thin and we're going to be together when it's all over. Amen. So let's decide to give our children the very best memories we can. And we can do it if we put forth our best effort with God's help. Well, we're going to sing a song of encouragement to anyone who needs uh, the prayers of the church tonight or for anyone 
who um, is not yet a Christian, but you want to be, and you are a believer, and you're willing to repent and confess your faith in Jesus, and you're willing to receive baptism so that the innocent blood of Jesus Christ will remove the sin from your heart. Not only remove it, uh, but it will be forgiven and forgotten. That's what the scripture says about this forgiveness that is available from God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you need the prayers of the church, if you need baptism for forgiveness of sin, he's reaching out to you. Would you come to him now while together we stand and sing?